governments and rest of them will be attending and will be surely getting benefit of it. So hopefully uh, it would be a, a, a wonderful start. And uh, now I request you formally to say a few words about this, this program and then we can start it. We are especially thankful, uh, especially thankful to Kemkan and you. And uh, uh, hopefully he may join us uh, around nine. If we, if we continue it till nine, or uh, uh, next time he will come, uh, he he will surely join us. And ask to get all those record uh, recordings for him, and uh, uh, he has also asked you uh, to to give monthly feedback. How these 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 uh, system professors are progressing in their their research learning. Thank you very much, and now I ask uh, I. I invite you to, to start your lecture. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one thing, Professor, that definitely uh, you look more fresh this morning. Uh, so, good weekend. Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, to be uh, combined. Uh, sessions in which there will be a uh, contribution from both sides, contribution from me, as well as contribution from those six participants that have uh, by UC. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that that interaction will make it much more crucial than just one way or uh, a channel where I come in and say a few words and then. Uh, you know, but there might be as much opportunity to ask questions or, you know, to see whether you know, what is uh, being told is useful or not. So I'll start first with just, you know, just a little bit. Uh, the format will be that uh, this will be, there will be reading assignments. So every time I put some reading assignments and send an email as well. Uh, this is this web page here on Eliadne that I have started for this particular course. Uh, so, so reading assignments will be posted there. Basically, these uh, are likely to be like uh, to be articles. Uh, occasionally, maybe a few videos that may be of benefit. Um, these will be something to go through prior to lecture, so that uh, when you are here, you may. Better and deeper understanding of what is actually going to be discussed. And uh, the main purpose of this the interaction that will also be more fruitful if there is a, a better understanding of what's happening in the background. Then the uh, session discussion, uh, these will be at the beginning of session. Uh, so these discussions, basically, these will be presentations by you, by those six faculty, will be presented in very, very short five minute uh, talk uh, about what they have done based on prior life. And so this course will apply, and then uh, there will be, of course, uh, uh, some like I will show. And then there will be what I call home assignment, but it can be anything. But basically, what it is is that based on lecture, how you incorporate that lecture into your research. That is what will be home assignment. So there will be, of course, questions that I will put on the academy. And then, based on those questions, you will answer those questions in view of, of your research idea or research that you plan to do. And, and so you will submit it also at the end. So this way, it's easier for you as well as for me to follow up on, uh, on what has been submitted, what has been done, uh, and what you are expected to do instead of me individually emailing everybody. The emails from everybody, and then those emails get buried somewhere in hundreds of emails that I would get otherwise. Um, so it's quite possible that I may miss some of your emails. So all that together at one place will be useful for me to keep track of things. So, uh, 
who can participate? I think this also is uh, a concession um, you know, doubt, but there are six uh, uh, assistant professors who have been uh, nominated by VC for this, but it is also open to anyone else who can participate uh, in sessions and also can participate in discussions as well, can ask questions to respond and can and go over it, but they will not be required to go over these uh, uh, home assignments. They are encouraged to do reading assignments, and uh, for those who would like to have their account also established as a reality, you can kindly email me. My email address, they are right in the middle of me. It's r-u-a-y-y-u-m at j-h-m-i dot p-d-u. Email me there, and I'll send you an invitation email. Uh, and then you can also enroll there and, and see what reading assignments are being posted, what will be the next session, and, um, and you know, participate in discussions that will be over there. And website, uh, yeah, so basically, if you see, uh, it has uh, this content section where uh, whatever discussion, whatever mainly content that we will be discussing next week will be posted here as the main highlighted feature as, well as uh, importing uh, uh, all resources or the assignments will sit there. The last section basically will uh, will contain uh, tasks or sort of home assignments, those questions that needs to be prepared and answered by faculty that is enrolled in this program. It's not for other uh, and then the discussion uh, section is where um, if, if anyone who is participating in this, whether uh, it's enrolled faculty or those who are basically sort of uh, audited, can uh, and discuss things. So can post questions, talk about those uh, topics, those type of things. So this is uh, the website, like I said, that is if you have not received an email, please send me an email and I will resend you uh, an invite. Uh, if uh, you would, uh, you know, if you would like to be invited, you are not one of those six uh, participants, then please send me an email and I will send you an invite. Or, you know, uh, first thing I think is uh, to request uh, those six participants who uh, are here to briefly introduce their research idea, whatever it is. Just a very quick background, two to three minutes, and what research idea is, if that is uh, possible. So if, you know, uh, you are, uh, if that can be done, that would be great. So who is the first one who can come? Assalamualaikum. I am Dr. Sohail from Plastic Surgery Department. I have few two research ideas, and uh, today I'm, I'll discuss uh, both, uh, taking two to three minutes for uh, uh, one uh, research idea. So first uh, research. So here is one second. So I'll choose just one, so that that one you can then carry along with you. You can tag on that one also. Okay, I'll discuss the second research idea, that is uh, the use of heparin in burn patients. Uh, actually, I will uh, first of all introduce that uh, uh, burn patients, uh, they fall uh, frequently in our unit and we used to manage them uh, routinely. And uh, among the uh, burn patients, the fire burn and the scat burn, there are four categories of the burn. And the uh, second degree burns, they are the most critical, most, most difficult to uh, uh, identify and treat. And, uh, they are uh, they are basically divided uh, other divided subdivided on the basis of uh, thermal involvement into two types superficial partial thickness burn and deep partial thickness burn and they are uh, uh, distinguished mostly clinically but uh, there are adjuvants also used to differentiate these two categories like is Doppler uh, and clinically the uh, they are a little uh, there is a little different uh, clinical criteria which are used to differentiate them but in uh, hallmark of this uh, second degree is that uh, uh, there is uh, they are very 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 painful 
So managing these patients uh, 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 with the conventional techniques, uh, this is that is a painful uh, way of management. Different techniques are that we use to manage the superficial partial thickness burn, the polyfat skin ointment, and uh, addition of a lignocaine in that. And for those patients who are having a deep partial thickness, we use silvazine cream. And that is used once a day or twice a day in conventional treatment. Before that, the patient has give, patient has to be clean and they have to be given wash so that the cream that is removed and the next application is applied. That process is very painful. In mind, the people they are working and they found that heparin can reduce the pain and also the hospital stay and improve the wound healing. Uh, when I searched the literature, I found that there are very few papers uh, regarding the uh, use of heparin and they are uh, showing the statistical differences. Uh, that shows that uh, statistically it is very important, uh, good that uh, we use heparin in second degree burn and it reduces significantly uh, the uh, pain of the uh, patient. Uh, but, the, uh, but when I saw the number of the studies, they were uh, less in number and they are not properly randomized. Uh, the uh, study, uh, one uh, study that lacks the sample only uh, six to ten patients are there. And the other studies, uh, they didn't uh, differentiate between superficial partial thickness and deep partial thickness. With the uh, wound healing process, that is different for both categories. So that's why we differentiate them. The superficial partial thickness burns, they heal within three weeks. And the deep partial thickness, they heal within three to eight weeks. So we are applying uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, happening on superficial partial thickness. They are healing in three weeks, uh, not differentiating them from deep partial thickness. So study will be biased because they are going to heal in three weeks. So it is further uh, workup and a randomized controlled studies uh, to uh, evaluate, first of all, differentiate these two categories and then uh, apply the treatment. This treatment process, it is uh, readily available. It is easy to perform. It is uh, cheap and also it uh, reduces the pain and hospital uh, duration and uh, treatment. So that was the rationale to have a better evidence for the use of uh, this uh, adrenal uh, heparin in burn patients. So my objective is that to measure the uh, uh, quantity of uh, uh, this uh, while uh, the patient is hospitalized, and also to see uh, and to also to measure the uh, the wound healing time. Thank you. I have uh, used two references from uh, two last previous papers, one of two, uh, 2012 and one of 2013, where they have shown that this is statistically significant and it reduces the pain score and uh, not only the pain but also the uh, wound healing. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, happy with that uh, research. I think it's still wonderful. My name is Fawad, uh, and I am Assistant Professor of Endocrinology. Uh, I have uh, sent you one article which is actually uh, still in early days with two actually endpoints. I was discussing it with my fellow colleagues. The point was uh, the role of vitamin D in uh, the insulin resistance in type 2 patients, evidenced by or as will be proven by decrease in the score of HMA HOMA, which is a homostatic model for metabolic assessment of insulin resistance. The uh, and the, the idea basically in launching this sort of research was number one. Uh, vitamin D is basically uh, has most of the non-skeletal roles in uh, proving multiple other options 
apart from metabolic bone disease and it and number 2 it is not been proven yet which part which dose and which route is favorable to avail this kind of effect if this effect actually lasts here so my point is number 1 ke vitamin d as it is uh, there and can be incorporated as a part of the treatment for type 2 diabetic patients in increasing or improving the glycemic control decreasing the insulin resistance and number 2 what route and what is the appropriate dosage of vitamin d3 in improving this kind of thing Thank you very much. Very nice. Great. Thank you. Please drop us and I have uh, sent you an email with my idea. I will briefly just summarize few facts. so that it's easy for other participants to understand uh, we know that uh, bacteria adhere more to the polyfilament uh, <coughs> sutures than monofilament sutures so we have all that uh, when we have skin sutures a polyfilament is inside the body which is exposed to the antibiotics for the fact that uh, we cannot eradicate the bacteria from the universe the bacteria have been in the universe for millions of years they were exposed to antibiotics for long time only that we have come to know the antibiotics for last 70 years it was that uh, if we <coughs> culture this portion of the suture to whether we are developing resistant strains to the antibiotics to which uh, being exposed and if find resistant strains and are we contributing the resistant strains to the hospital environment so this was the idea and i wanted to research on that thank you thanks Okay. All right. Just a minute. Uh, I'm looking for. Sir, welcome to my meeting. Sir, we will discuss my idea number one. I will not discuss the rest of the ideas which I have already sent to you. Uh, in this uh, research idea, basically the population is uh, perineal fistula or uh, the vestibular uh, fistula in females uh, will undergo with uh, the intervention of primary repair as compared to uh, stage repair, and, uh, and the outcome will be measured in terms of post of complication. and uh, their continuous score uh, basically the idea of this research is in an institute with an uh, institute basically uh, what we were doing uh, was uh, that we were uh, going for stage repair in which we made the colostomy first for these females and then later on definitive repair and then the colostomy closure so three in three stages the outcome was achieved but um, Uh, Kena and his colleagues, they have given us in 2015, uh, which is the major committee which is dealing with ARM. Uh, so they, they have given the option of both uh, the stage repair and primary repair. And uh, my study is basically focusing on the uh, fact that primary repair is uh, in our setup. has same outcomes as compared to the stage uh, setup and then uh, uh, that's why it will be a superior option uh that thank you thank you very much very nice um my name is dr zair and i have uh, i'm trying to to search for uh, against i mean a guideline i mean what patients who present in an emergency and we all of them um, any patient with trauma and needs to get an x-ray chest done 
uh, I want to see how many of these patients would eventually have a change in their management by getting this extra done and how it is good uh, or it, it's going to be better than on just a clinical examination. So uh, this is my research idea. I, I, I believe that most of the, many of the patients which we do not suspect usually the management doesn't change by getting an extra done and it's, it's the usual practice. Uh, now, Dr. Khalid is going to present his, his research idea. He is a volunteer, and I believe that volunteers can work in those who have been in, in, included daughters and uh, vice chancellors. He requested uh, the, the vice chancellor, and he has specially to be included in those six persons. So, I will email his content. Now, we will have seven participants. So, he is going to present his, his research idea. That's the seventh one. Uh, my, uh, uh, my, I uh, investigate the perceptions of uh, the faculty the students uh, after the introduction of the uh, modular program in at KEMU at undergrad level. Uh, we think that uh, basic sciences and two years and then the clinical part in the last three years. So the program has been introduced and now it is in its third year. And it is driven by the fact that WHO is going to be recognized uh, the medical colleges uh, if do not uh, adopt this uh, integrated modular program. So I wanted to investigate the uh, perceptions of the faculty as the students. I will initially plan to like uh, a questionnaire to all of them and then try to generate themes and then do um, in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews uh, for some selected uh, on the basis of those themes which are generated by that. So I, I hope that my this endeavor would uh, uh, first identify the, uh, the problem areas and maybe in a subsequent study um, a more uh, logical and formal uh, measures are taken so that uh, this introduction is not imposed so that these students, I feel that most of the students feel that it has been imposed on them. So basically to elaborate the perceptions and uh, of the faculty as well as the students. Thank you. I think they, 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 they have presented their research ideas and uh, one of the participants, Dr. Sapija, who uh, uh, is not here, I think. Okay, she is here, but uh, due to some uh, unable circumstances, she could not send you, but hopefully she will send, she will be participating in, in next discussion, the next assignment actively, but for the time being, we, they, they have presented all their research ideas. Thank you, so I'll then uh, move forward and uh, we'll expect uh, hopefully in a day or so uh, something <laughs> from data as well. Uh, all right, so, so uh, before delving into the research question, I think uh, how to this, how to, uh, normally a research question, I think the first thing that I like to say is what actually we is and how we do it. I'm going to give a very high 
high heart rate cardiac movement view uh, of, of research so that when we are moving forward, we are clear what we are doing. So there are two main ways, two main viewpoints one can look at a research activity that we do. And being physicians, you know, I, I think it's easy to think of it there is an anatomy of research. So research is basically structure of research, what it is made up of. Or it's study plan, whatever study plan we have. And physiology of research is function of research. What is its goal? Why we are what we want to achieve. What it is going to do. So basically, research can be looked at from an anatomical standpoint, from its structure. And you want to see what its goal is, what its function is, how it works, how it happens. And so, me, you know, this plan basically, you all know, you know, roughly somewhere around in this, uh, along this, uh, this uh, these, these bullet points that you have a research question, you have a background and signal. And then you have design, time frame, and technological design, time frame, how long the study is going to be, environment, so predictor outcome, confounding variable, and then statistical analysis, you know, what the hypothesis, what sample size is, what type of test you're going to do, and how you're going to install the And the main thing is about what study plan is, whenever you are developing the research study plan, do write it down. And the reason for writing it down is quite important. The reason for, the, for writing it down is so that each time you go back, you want to look at, you have a to go back and look at what originally you designed. So let's say today you have decided certain inclusion exclusion criteria. Down there, when you are including a patient, enrolling a patient, you may become any other one a particular inclusion criteria and that patient may get included at that point. Uh, just simply that you have not written down your study plan uh, up front. So, so that will tell you if you are moving away from your original study plan. Now you can of course modify it during your research, but that will be then clearly declared that you have modified your study plan. Today, if you have written it down, you point the way to written it down, the likelihood of patients being enrolled, the same criteria, and the beginning will be the same, that will be the end. The end will remain the same. How your measurements are going to remain the same. You have written study question, research question, so you will be focusing on answering that particular question. So, study plan, up front, is good. So, whenever you want to modify, you can definitely modify it. But it is really clear that for this reason, my patient was in this particular aspect. And so that you have that as to how did your research progress from the beginning to the end. And this is really very quickly what the goal of the goal of research is. But this slide, which seems quite busy slide. Uh, so both anatomy and the theology of research. So the reason for research is that there's some truth in the world that we want to discover. That is why we are doing research is because we believe there is some truth that we don't know at this time. There is some fact that we don't know at this time that we would like to discover. So, so that is truth of the universe, or true world. And so that is what becomes a research question. That leads to identifying the target population, and the study design, we plan our study, we collect and then the sample, we measure all those variables that we want to do, we want to measure, we conduct our actual study. Now, we conducted our study, we have done all those measurements, then we have findings. If you analyze the data, we are finding The findings then tell us what is the truth in that particular study. So that will be sort of an internal validity. That 
what your findings are, what results are, what I'm telling you, how you understand it, how you understand the mic, those measurements, how you understand those results. Trying to identify, trying to find out what actually happened in your study. And based on that, based on results from your study, you try to extrapolate those findings to the rest of the world. You try this. So that is sort of, you try to externally validate uh, 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 That will be external validity. So your goal is that your study should be internally valid. Infer from your study what is the population be consistent, should be true, study should be internally valid. And those that you obtain from your study are the generalized to the population, so it should be externally valid. As the goal is, goal is for all this exercise. So I have a question, having a study plan, do you actually get study? All the goal is so that you can find that particular answer, that particular fact, that particular truth that are in this whole problem. And all these, going through all this, there are certain things that can produce error. And designing a study in a way, and then inferring results from the study in a way where you minimize error is really important so that we can reach your goal. So over here, it's an error can be random, or error can error can be systematic. And the matter basically means an error that can make us go in either direction. Have an effect of towards uh, make a result making significant from significance. It's kind of it's randomly it can sort of move. So move your measurements, move your outcome in either direction. The error is similar to bias. It produces error in one direction. In one direction, just in one direction, that's not bias. So we'll discuss more of these errors and other things in subsequent lectures. But this is important from trying to understand what the goal is, the ultimate goal of any research is trying to identify trying to define what happened in the world, what particular request is after this question. For we plan to hold this study, do this study, get findings from the study. Results fully trying to understand what the fact is or truth is within that study, and that trying to identify how we can generalize to the rest of the and to basically identify what the fact is, what the truth is, what the you know, coming to a topic, uh, you know, the research question, how to, how to, so, uh, so there are a few slides about, you know, how to identify the research question. All questions, depending on, you know, what you want to do. But, you know, various ways you can do it. You can, you know, from your clinical practice, from your prior research that you've been doing, to searching medical literature, uh, domain interface, centers and tier, grant announcements. All these are potential sources from where you can find ideas for research, ideas that are important and personal. And when you try to you know, that are challenging, so diagnostic dilemma, the clear diagnostic path, and you want to, you want to, you want to identify. So like, for example, there is one question by Roser that basically tries to identify, you know, Chest X-rays. Chest X-rays are good in many cases. Uh, 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 managing the clinical exam, it's clinical management in many cases, uh, and whether chest X-rays are really helpful or not. So, so this has no clear answer. That is something uh, that is coming out of clinical practice. And just that there are no clear treatments. There's no treatment for a particular disease. So for example, there is this one question uh, by Dr. Fatima about the uh, any closure versus the stage to repair of patients, not having a clear question how to manage it. So about what should be that also uh, you know, something that comes out of practice. 
second outcome you see is a poor response to treatment. You see the surprisingly good response to treatment. In those cases, you start looking at how you know, like that happens, that can become the research question. You know, potentially one could be, you know, if someone started using heparin first for her, um, you know, oh, there's a really it's a much better response than I was expecting. And that became a research question at that for the study. Why is being skeptical? Uh, thanks to many things that we and we know we are doing it right, but it's not considered very as an example, you know, for patients who come in with acute myocardial infarction, the third is you give them oxygen, you need to give them nitrate, you give them aspirin, you do it, and, you know, all of the sort of things. But basically, we've been taught that you have to give them oxygen and aspirin, and there's a more and other things. But what is the evidence that oxygen, giving oxygen health in patients will have without insaturation? So we will not find a study that has primary outcome, patient based outcome, and that shows that it, the oxygen is shown to be, um, in fact, there's some evidence that if you give too much oxygen, that's how they make the infection, because that increases increase the amount of oxygen there. So, to be skeptical is helpful. In fact, a study uh, in November was presented at the American Heart Association session. We are trying to answer this question and found that, uh, you know, it really is not helpful in people who are often concentrating. Saturation in blood is, is already about 94 percent. They didn't have patient-related outcomes. So they had the, you know, cardiac enzymes and the EP resolution and those types. So, so how they were they able to do this type of study was just being skeptical question. So it's important to be skeptical of the question those practices that we routinely do, whether those practices have been studied or not. But these are being done simply because hundred years ago one came up with this idea that there was nothing better than that. Research. So you know those who are already doing some some we find it when you answer one question, you have completed your study. There is a study that you pose more than one question in the giving answer to your question. You pose more than one question, more than one study question. So, you know, from your own research, the next logical step it could be you want to collect more data to have that uh, you know, show that in fact your results that are robust. Uh, you want to do mechanistic studies whether to, to understand that, you know, how this actually happens. So, for example, you know, if uh, Dr. Fawad finds that vitamin D, in fact, decreases insulin resistance, the next thing would be to see mechanistic studies. Um, how is that happening? At what stage is it happening? Is it vitamin D because of just the other? This molecular structure that is causing is out of nuclear effect of vitamin D. Or is it that there are nuclear effect of vitamin D that are If that is the case, then which ones of the genes are being um, being upregulated or downregulated by vitamin D that are resulting in changes in insulin resistance? So my study is validation study. Is that have been done by other uh bodies, but have not been tested in a larger sample of different samples. That would be something also maybe of interest. I've been trying to predict a particular outcome. And, uh, you know, alternative strategies. Uh, using a different study design. I said someone has studied something in a case cohort, uh, in, in a cohort study or a case control study, and you want to study the same thing then in an interventional, interventional study, in a clinical trial. So, a good example. You know, there were a lot of studies that were done showed that hormone replacement therapy, postmenopausal women, was being reused for longer, had no Alzheimer's disease, no fractures, less cardiac disease, had stroke, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all these were cohorts then. And then when in fact someone ended up with a clear trial, um, they found consistently using all clinical trials that the results were different. 
and that in, in, there was no benefit. In, in, in fact, there was harm. So we're using harm or replacement. So, a different study that I may be able to answer, uh, you know, a different question. Do you want to say, uh, you know, like I was telling, uh, talking about it earlier from all the previous research, it can come up. So, it's also very helpful. So, many journals usually, you know, they're just there's a particular topic and a question and go over it and they present all their study and then when they, when you go down and you see the limitation section that can help you identify you know what were the limitations within this study that I may be able to address. So the study you may be able to find the study you may be able to find that there are certain things that perhaps were not done. So it should have been done if you want to differently. So, patient studies like one study or better studies, studies that someone else did but didn't do it correctly. So, you can do a study better, you know, with a better sample size, better measurements, a different population group, or, you know, more exclusive studies. So, a better study design would be another way. Need to study it, all those people, people don't like it, uh, but if what their study is done exclusively in wide group Scandinavia, uh, this may be something where you want to see whether how patients Different uh, or not, and you know, attending conferences and meetings are where you know lots of presentation, a lot of discussion. You are giving the presentation to people who are uh, giving the posters, uh, ask questions there, so you can actually interact with them, ask them questions, and and uh, different ideas can come up from there. And with that, what I mean basically is the domain, set of domains like two different fields. So, for example, clinical medicine and uh, uh, clinical medicine and uh, engineering. So, so these these two are two different domains. So, the interface is the one place where these come close enough, where the connecting are one we can identify. Uh, you know, new area for research, for example, biology, interacting with chemistry, or electronics, or medical medicine, interacting with, uh, uh, coming in contact with bioinformatics and biostatistics. And you can come up with really novel ideas, novel ways of determining, understanding, and answering research, uh, and coming up with better ideas of how things can be done. We may be, for example, developing you know, this iPhone and, and, and Android based phones and all over. Developing apps, for example, that can help patients. Developing apps that can help medical students, for example. Developing apps that can, um, you know, do different things, migrate different variables. Uh, so these are sort of things that are potentially possible if you're looking at from a uh, domain interface and, uh, and what type of research ideas can be generated. And do this so by collaborating researchers in other species. So, for example, you know, uh, working with software uh, uh, engineers, uh, software developers will be a good way of developing an app that is clinically useful and then you can study whether there is a particular role of that type of, of either teaching intervention or whatever on a particular outcome. Reading uh, journals from other fields will be useful. So, your colleagues, People that you work with are really resource fighting their thoughts, bump in them every day, talk with them, you know, uh, how you collaborate with them. Meet them at regular research meetings, uh, research progress meetings, and research meetings that are there in the department from the hospital uh, or the institution where you talk about research that is ongoing so that they can, uh, you know, they share ideas and learn from each other. Uh, from a research seminar, whether those are intra or Seminars with the institution or or so you know if information about you and your study is widely known, other people who are doing the same type of work at an institution, we all come to know about you. Become your collaborators. We can work together and come up with better ideas. And the methods of course are extremely important. So methods are extremely useful, especially because they have in-depth knowledge. So they can actually tell you before it is a medical journal, before it is in text, before it is widely known, which way feel this movie, which way feel this movie. This gives you some idea, uh, five years ago, 
how you formulate one particular study that we're discussing, and everyone at that time uh, in medical journals and stuff for gene expression. Everyone was doing uh, microarrays, and that is all that we knew about that. We said that yeah, we have to talk to uh, one of our uh, uh, top people, one of our very uh, advanced uh, researcher in, in genomics, and you know, the people that is now coming in and will be extremely booming with the actually RNA sequence, not a microarray gene expression. So if you want to do your study using RNA sequence, oh, microarray. And we listened to them, and uh, we planned our study uh, around RNA sequence. And, uh, you know, basically at this time, uh, we are where field is, is moving. We are right at the, at the cutting edge of the field. And people who have in depth knowledge, it is really useful. So now, if you have too many questions, so, you know, sometimes that is not the problem that you don't have a study question. Sometimes the problem is you have just too many questions. Like, well, you know, at least uh, uh, two people I got more than one research idea that uh, sense to. So, you know, and, and that, is, that is a sign of really uh, a very active, imaginative brain. Uh, and what to do if you have too many questions? So, uh, you know, there's too many ideas, and those ideas may be your own ideas that you come up with. There will be other people, friends, colleagues, mentors, seniors, um, your, your, you know, uh, uh, your, the, the partner uh, who may be uh, telling you some ideas. You may end up with there's too many research ideas. In that case, you know, that also becomes a question or a problem. But kids also have lots of questions, and they're also very imaginative. But, uh, it, you know, so one cannot pursue all questions. You have one, maybe two, but preferably one, focusing on, on that particular research question at any given time. And that's important. Now you can choose uh, which question out of all those ideas, out of all those things that come up, which I choose is use this thing called final. Use this mnemonic, and I'll go into this more detail. Use it to identify out of all these ideas, all these questions, which one should I choose? Which two, if you want to choose two, which two should I choose? It's just look at this finer aspect of This is it about all these questions that I have, all these ideas I have, which of these are most pleasant and most useful for me and my research. So this is what final stands for. It stands for feasible. The first question, research ideas, feasible, should be interesting, should be novel, should be ethical, and So the meaning is that you ask yourself, can I answer this question with resources and time that you're available? We can ask all sorts of questions. If you don't have resources or time, Available to do to work on that, work on the idea, work on the particular topic. That is, so it needs to be visible to you. Ask this question yourself. Able to enable enough patience, patience and the type of patience that you want to, resources that you have. So, that's what someone, if someone wants to study a rare or genetic disease or a phenomenon or something like that. That we may not be able to identify enough patients within his or her practice, within the same institution. We may have to collaborate with other and all those things. So you have to basically think we're going to have enough number of type of patients that are needed for your particular research. Yeah. You have enough resources. You have the type of analysis that are going to be the type of lab that they're going to be needing to answer that particular question. You have enough resources. These resources actually have that type of particular data management system and, and data analysis system for that particular type of research that you want to do. So for some, some questions, you need a relatively small amount of data. Questions the data may be humongous, the data may be really large, the data may be 
can be really terrible. For example, again, a part of a sequence is just one file. Example, part of a sequence in data is a 100 gigabyte. You can very well imagine that you need to have that type of resources available on. So you have fund available for it. Who's going to be funding this? It's going to be a situation which is going to be uh, some other source. Is it going to be unfunded? Do you have uh, then uh, some uh, volunteer or some other uh, the other type of resources that we have in that uh, non funded situation? For me, that particular field. So, are you self expert in that particular topic? You are planning to the journey to study. Or is it, uh, or, you can, or are there others who you can collaborate with? So, so if there's some particular expertise that really needed throughout the study, it's better to have a police, expert police, collaborate with you if you yourself do not have that expertise. But that fact also needs to be looked at. And then you have time to recruitation for all organizers because recruitment takes time, and then depending on what type of follow up you have in mind, that will take time. And some analysis will take time. And so basically what feasibility means is, is it impossible? Is it possible? It has to be really possible. And the more possible it is, the more feasible. So I see, you know, how you make it possible and how possible it is. Because then we put one question to make it feasible and potentially possible. Which one of those is most feasible? So is that question interesting to you? Yeah, because the reason is, if it's not interesting to you, then you should not spend time on it. Because once you start moving one particular topic, much better from very good standpoint for you to keep digging deeper, keep exploring deeper that particular topic. So if it's interesting to you now, it's not going to be interesting to you four years down the road. And if you want to choose a new topic, a new arena, a new field, uh, a new research focus four years down the road. Why am I doing it now? Why am I doing it four years? Interesting to others. This is important. Because that will, that will determine not only whether you will be So, if it is not interesting to others, then you're not going to be getting funding. You're not going to get any collaborators. Uh, you know, the recognition that is again something that is uh, needed, it will not be there. So, if it's interesting, likely you're going to get funding. Likely other people would love to collaborate with you, other people will be working on it because it's an interesting topic, it's a hot topic. And you're going to get recognition of the people who advise you based on that important work of you. So these are also important questions. It's interesting. So that's the second thing. Second or question when you want to prune that lip idea that you get. Which one is good or bad? If feasible, can you do it? Can you make that impossible? Is it possible? How much possible, how much possible you can make it? Second, is it interesting to you? Is it interesting to other people? No. So that is a great new finding. So now keep in mind here that now is, is a, basically a term used here somewhat loosely. So thanks. Generally. Science in, uh, in small steps. It does not move forward in big steps. So each study answers one small aspect, a bigger, larger question. And so novelty means it is is it gonna progress in in at least in some small way. So generally it is not paradigm changing, generally it is just a small step. Fundamental. And to identify whether it's novel or not, you have not met Search like uh, you know, search done by most of you so for your forty questions, and uh, and see if other people have done it or not. If it's been already been well studied topic, then perhaps it's not worth spending time on. 
it has not been explored before, then it perhaps is novel. If feasible, if it's interesting, it becomes really novel. And validating previous findings for those that need validation. Or maybe it's considered novel in a way that it is validating those findings. But if only if it is needed, validation is needed. So if someone comes up with a score that can identify people who are going to do very well after a particular type of uh, surgical procedure, or after a particular type of drug treatment or chemotherapy. And so, but that is the only study. Uh, it really changes things tremendously. So you want to validate it. So that's what we still somewhat considered. Uh, if it's true, that also is a system. Uh, if we think, we now that fourth one is ethical. Is the question ethical? There are many dimensions of how you want to say ethical. Is it ethical from patient standpoint? But from humans, it should not be uh, exposed to excessive risk. So as a primary as a principal investigator, it's your responsibility that patients and humans are, are not put to excessive risk. But that is why we also, that is why we determine that whether your assessment of risk is right like or not. So being an impartial observer can determine that the humans are not put to excessive risk. You should report the written and consent that can be explained to it. You should report autonomy of participants. It should have a same group of subpopulation that your particular research on which it could be applied. So you study a particular group of the same sample. So, you know, it perhaps is not that big an issue by the for example, but it is more uh, it be a problem in countries that are trojanous like the US, where they are African American, they are white, and then they are Hispanic. If you do a research using mostly African American, Research should be able to benefit the set of people that are. We have to respect animal life. Society generally is an ethical perspective. From a society standpoint, the set is ethical. Information gained is useful for society. This is really happening again. We have a uh, 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 feasible, we have things, we have novel, we have ethical. And so the last fifth one is, is it relevant? Now, is it a relevant concept? Yeah, that's to whom? But certainly one can think about it. You know, is it relevant in which way? And finding it relevant in one way or the other, it perhaps will, will be all right. So, can it be incorporated into clinical practice? That's one way of looking at relevant. So, you know, intervention or implementation is extremely expensive. It's going to happen. Let's say that you know you have to put ten people to monitor that patient for ten days, two years. Get, it's not going to be possible in a clinical practice to incorporate that type of, of work. So if it's prohibitively expensive, then perhaps it's not going to be useful in a clinical practice. Then you practice a policy that does direct future research. Uh, that can investigate the disease that relatively common. Of course, rare diseases also need to be need to be looked at. But uh, you know, uh, if if you have to choose limited resources and time, the disease that is relatively common, what disease that affects very few people, uh, you know, society standpoint, the relevant standpoint, it's better to choose a disease that is relatively common. Limited resources. In case of unlimited resources. And of course, that question should not arise. Now you have use those final criteria. Use those final criteria to pull down the list of 10, 20, 20 50 ideas that you have. You can come up with maybe one or two. Just these are really at the top of it. Both the soft final criteria are most feasible, et cetera, et cetera. And so I evaluated the Finer aspect of the research and idea, research question. And now to report. Now, you write your first question statement. But then we, when we start thinking about the ideas or research questions, are kind of too broad. Too broad because those are ideas. Yet, yet, 
the tools sharpen them and kind of uh, uh, those those ideas in, in more details. Generally, we end up with very broad questions. Examples are like you know drugs to use for control of pharmacology, or how many ones in that application. What they did will include patients' drug compliance, or is more satisfied with the treatment system. Just some examples of uh, questions that we brought. So how are you going to know? How are you going to work that broad question and put it into a question that actually impacts the good enough is that can that actually rest with the research plan? And what could what would be the research question? But the issue for well, now, the next thing one get is after finder is Kiko. So you'll, you'll go through this Kiko thing and see if it is, you know, and how to, how you can narrow that down for questions. So what Kiko stands for is, it is a P for patient, I for intervention, for comparison, for so the intervention, Intervention will be when you are actually intervening in a setting that is clinical trial, but if it's a clinical trial, it'll be exposure. Or it will be other outcome of your interest, whatever it is. So then is, you know, whether you are having a controlled arm, you're going to be using non-exposed people, how you're going to do the non-exposed part. And then, or you want to just have them to do it. You want to have whatever it is. It's the person who puts out. Question. What should, what should compare them throughout? So it will help you to narrow down the broad question and build a good research question. When you're looking at the patient population, then you have to look who are patients you trust. Click on that. A particular age group, gender, or a particular population that you're interested in. So the second thing that you need to you need to look at from when you're looking at patient population, you want to narrow down your, your so first you, when you're defining patient population, these are things you need to look at. Where should we recruit it from? From clinic, from hospital, um, you know, community, from school, a college, from university. Where are these patients come from? So that will be if you want to improve upon this first step or that I put there. What drugs do you use? You know, in this question, you can see there is no fully identified patient population. I say it's hypertensive. Uh, we could have a question, but there's a type. But hypertension. So, in newly diagnosed hypertension, what will come in? So you can start off identify your patient population. We have declared these should be newly diagnosed. I don't know hypertension more common population. These who come to ER because they have severe headaches because they are really having extremely high blood pressure. These are not you know, people who are hypertensive, therefore, uh, you're not clearly declaring what type of patient population. So, you know, of course, there are other ways of thinking about it. Maybe you should be really clear about the patient population. Well, Patient population, you can think about participant population also, because there is one question here uh, from the college in which uh, there does not seem to be any patients with participants to that. So you can say, so what participant population? It's in people, uh, you know, interventions and outcomes, but before interventions, but before we move on to intervention, uh, I just want to say a few things about interventions and outcomes. But both are somewhat related in a way because. Uh, used to really uh, uh, work these uh, in the same way. So here, demonic is smart. Be smart, or smart. So what smart and for is to be really specific. One should be specific about it. It should not be poorly defined. It should not be used if there is a drug. You should clear about what what dose, what drug, what dose of that drug. So it should be migratory. Sanction and outcomes should be migratory. You can then migratory outcomes. It should not be something 
that is not clearly my trip. So well, that those those interventions you can do, those outcomes that can be achieved. So, so it should be achievable. So the all the real estate uh, interventions should be reliable, or outcomes should be reliable, it should be real estate. In other words, that interventions in a timely manner comes occur with the time frame that you plan to study. Whenever you're looking at which intervention, which outcomes, you have to think about these, uh, these five aspects. So, back to our list of key goals, we talk about patient population. And what we're talking about is uh, intervention. Our predictor is based on cohort. Uh, so, what therapeutic diagnostic, preventive, or other health care intervention? In the first study, so it should be clearly defined, like like I think uh, what factors or exposure you want to examine. This is for cohort studies, your case control studies, cross section studies. What are you interested in comparing if you basically want to look at a repeat strategy and then this is a useful or not? So, what would be for drugs for controlling hypertension would be not a core paradox. So you're committing yourself to one particular drug. You have a bit of dose as well. So, depending on what you want to do, you can come and buy 25 or both doses one day. Control of competitor. What is in studies? Now, what will be the control? Is it going to be some other alternative treatment? Is it going to be a third or path that is going to be compared with licensed treatment? Or is it going to be compared with placebo? Some historical control on your pre post study. Basically, where you're going to be, what will be your control population when you have to have that to see if the dimensions are working or not? Well, that actually are basically the exposure of the dimension actually. The exposure. You define the next post. The number of people that you will be comparing with, those will be an Example here would be what drugs to use for control of hypertension. So you can say, you know, these are newly diagnosed people who are coming in and you want to see, uh, you know, whether you want to use lifestyle change. Drugs also. You can choose a you can choose a lysinopril, you can choose candidatarin, you can choose any other drug or any other, or you can say simply no treatment. Um, and you can just say brochure or whatever. But something you want to compare with. So here, I put this example of lifestyle, lifestyle changes. Then on to uh, some part. So what is your desired outcome that you want to evaluate? But, uh, you know, of course, there are secondary outcomes. But the main thing is you have to have at least one main declared primary outcome that you're interested in. So that should become part of your research question. So it should be clear how to narrow that down from the broad question to us to the question. If the outcome, there's outcomes that are based on safety as well. Uh, but like an, at least there should be one main primary outcome that's clearly clear what it will be. For example, for this it will be Percentage of number of patients with controlled blood pressure, and you define controlled blood pressure, either solid blood pressure or, for example, uh, like 90 that solid blood pressure, whatever well, other, you know, the outcome measure you want to have. Something that will give you an idea, uh, give you a clear, concrete uh, uh, outcome measure. So, again, the newly diagnosed it has sort of had a better lifestyle changes for the control of blood pressure. And of course, we didn't put those numbers there, you know, in the kind of high dose or blood pressure level or all this and that. But we went into our developing a narrow research question. And, and, and we could have included these in this example. But, uh, but that would have made it the sentence that would have been boggy. So that's why those are out. Was going to went to an actual development research question. 
recap what we talked today. Um, so research ideas are abound. Where you can find them uh, in your research practice, in clinical practice, in literature, from, from mentors, brainstorming, all these type of activities. So research ideas are, are all over the place. You can, it should be difficult to find them. You should list your research ideas. You should find them. And then go to write your question. So uh, go from uh, from broader idea that you're writing down the question. This is Pico. Then your intervention and exposure uh, outcomes are smart. So basically using the smart mnemonic trying to really identify the intervention and exposure part of it. But I just want to clarify my concept about one thing only that you mentioned in uh, finer and as well as in smart. Certain things like, uh, can you give me set, uh, some example regarding clinical research as far as ethics is concerned? What do you really mean by ethical? I don't have the concept of ethical. I mean, the feasibility, ethics, uh, I just want to clarify my concept. Let's, uh, for, my, for example, my research idea that was vitamin D. So, what ethics should I follow as a research? Is the thing is, it, it, that you need to need to make sure is that it is that not already explored. It is already clear. So, so your question from vitamin D and trying to see whether it decreases the resistance or not is more of a mechanistic. Actually, you want to see whether this if, if it decreases insulin resistance, then think about okay, now I want to move forward. Want to do perhaps an intervention study where I'm going to give people vitamin D and see if adding vitamin D improves their diabetes. So at this time, it sounds more like it's a more a sort of a mechanistic looking at an intermediary and what if it has not been already explored and studied and as likely to result. In insulin, as likely to give you an idea. Uh, or, uh, so they are, you know, let me. So they are going to give you points, which basically means that you are as likely to say prior to study that this result is going to be positive, as you can say the result is going to be negative. So if you claim ignorance and literature, generally otherwise people will claim that yes. We don't know whether vitamin D in fact is going to help insulin resistance or not. But based on whatever we know about vitamin D and insulin resistance, it is possible it may help. It's possible it may not help. So, I'll put you into points where you say, you know, we basically at this time are unsure it's going to help or not. That situation where you should study it. If you are, it is uncertain it's going to happen. That, that is when you should be using it. If you're uncertain it's not going to help, then you shouldn't be using it. But if it is somewhere 50, 50, 60, 40, somewhere in that range, then yes, then that becomes your research question. Then you can call it. It's your ethical aspect where you would say yes. It be said that. The uh, ethical dimension of it, yes, my question. So, any question, any time, any research question, the, the first thing is, you know, the EQ points. Uh, you know, is it 50 50, 60 40, or uh, is it, you know, really a certain Thank you. The question is, uh, how, how, how should we take the novelty thing? I mean, 
if they, that nothing has been done, we know that we live in part of the world. We are always following others. We are following. So how can how can we do something new? We do an idea. The world is is moving ahead. They are they have all kinds of new gadgets. We still back in the in the 20th century. We call we are still using the same X-rays and clinical methods and evaluation. So how can we how can we define novelty? Okay, so uh, I think that is uh, so. What about the clinical practice and guidelines? The guidelines are uh, for clinical practice, not for research. And you have lost them for a second. Rashid is you can just wait till they come back. It happened a couple of times that they come right back. Yeah, they're back. back. Guidelines, clinical guidelines, clinical practice. In research, that really means that guidelines are not clearly giving an answer. Or those guidelines are based on evidence that we can work in this particular situation. So that can say, you know, no, I need to study it because guidelines are applicable to this particular situation. So guidelines are based not on evidence, but based on the example, back to the doctor and therapy and to the MI. Yeah, so that is part of my line, right? You know, but then, um, you know, people said it because there's no evidence for So, again, so there, is, uh, there is the, you know, this guideline uh, issue. Second one, technology. So, there's a certain type of research that needs technology. And there's a research that does not need there's a lot of research that is going on and that is potentially possible and that's not a technology. For example, what are strategies patient compliance? Right? For example, patient compliance to drug taking is always going to be a simple technology, simple technique. It cannot be a very exquisite, highly uh, costly technology. It's just not possible because patients, whether they are in US or not, be able to afford a debt of some dollar gadgets or companies for this. It's all going to be a change. It needs to be that we improve patient satisfaction. Right? Again, satisfaction is again going to be not. It's going to be again how our behavior is. How we make patients more knowledgeable, how we can get better knowledge this way. The fact of that is that can be done. Yes, for So, so for example, we have hospital has thousands of patients at any given time, you know, thousands of past patients at any given time. Uh, you know, those are with more or less the same type of things. They're having a long way to that, you know, yes, how do you have to change it? You know, just, you know, again, there's huge variability in the practice of how we can do interventions where we can decrease the variability. That every patient comes in and gets treatment that should be given to that patient. If it happens in the U.S., that pretty, pretty much should happen in Pakistan and many other countries also. It's never there. Because young patients are not patients get treatment that much treatment for whatever reason. So there are things that for which there is no technology. But then for even for technology, uh, uh, the cost of technology is getting cheaper. And back in most places in the US, for research also kind of support. I have learned, I think, uh, everything, and uh, there are no more questions. 
Talking about the assignments and uh, uh, next task. What I will do is uh, uh, I will look at my schedule and uh, very soon give a date for next talk. So, but before that, uh, today I will uh, put on the Eliadmi task based on the presentation uh, that uh, you know one research question that I will talk about a particular research question. That how they think that those questions can be answered based on uh, uh, based on those uh, based on sales discussion to brief the that reading assignment and uh, and those you know and the other research idea and how those questions can be answered and those needs to be uploaded within two weeks. Uh, I will put uh, the date. I will email also with you and then um, put the date over there as well. When will the next lecture? Uh, next week will be meeting, um, and then uh, at least two weeks before that, I will put the research assignment if not sooner. Uh, that needs to be looked at before. Uh, before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is Aisha Najeeb. I just have one uh, few words to say. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we... So I want to really thank Rehan Piyum. It's 11 p.m. for him right now, and he's missing the Oscars. I'm watching the Oscars and the Rehan Piyum at the same time. And Rehan, I learned a lot. This is an excellent presentation. Actually, the slides were so interesting that one doesn't lose the visual interest. So thank you for doing this. And thank you, Mustafa, for spearheading this. Uh, and I'm, I'm positive it's going to be a very successful program. Uh, we also have Dr. Dhanesh Bhatti. Um, he also joined our meeting, and he will also be assisting Rehan wherever needed in, in our research. And so I will have him introduce himself just for a few lines. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Najib. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so much, Bhati. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the uh, Department of Neurology in University of Nebraska Medical Center. So specialty is movement disorder, so my area of Clinical practice and research is Parkinson's disease and tremors, uh, especially use brain stimulation surgeries and surgical techniques for treatment. Uh, I have much of uh, formal training in research, but I've uh, gone through a lot of projects and then I have uh, uh, been uh, actively some research uh, recent. My, so I'm a graduate of 2004, uh, relatively very recent graduate compared to Dr. Kim and maybe many of you guys. Um, so my, I haven't, you know, there's a very, very wanted to comment that uh, these uh, research ideas are extremely interesting and very insightful, so I'm very impressed. Um, my, my personal favorite is the role of vitamin D. You know, there is a very actively ongoing research. Um, you know, we have uh, probably the second largest center for vitamin D research. Uh, the world that we are doing. So, in in our neurology, we've been looking at the role of vitamin D in immune um, modulation, and so autoimmune diseases in neurology have a big role of vitamin D research. But it seems very interesting. Uh, I'll to help in any ways I can. Uh, person, uh, unfortunately, my personal areas of interest are very focused uh, Parkinson's disease specifically. So, limitation on uh, many of the ideas presented that I'm familiar with them clinically. But to help in any ways I can. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.